गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन आई वेलकम यू ऑल अर्ली मॉर्निंग फर्स्ट डे स्टिल ऑडियंस इज देयर आई थिंक आई थिंक इट्स हैप्पी साइन सो सो आइडिया बिहाइंड दिस आई सी वॉज ऑल ऑफ अस हैव गॉन थ्रू रेजिडेंसी एंड वी ऑल नो दैट हाउ क्योटिक इट वॉज देर वॉज नो स्ट्रक्चर्ड प्रोग्राम देर वॉज ऑलवेज ए इशू विद वॉट वी वॉन्टेड एंड वॉट वी वर गेटिंग सो what we did was we just surveyed a lot of teachers and students that what is the expectation of teachers from the students and what is the expectations of the teachers uh, students from the teachers and just went ahead making a structured program so that is what we want to do so basically what i'll be doing is uh, we'll be covering it under five heads and uh, probably will be op- uh, keeping it open uh, for audience audience questions only so i have my co panelist uh, professor vijay sharma uh professor sandeepan bandopadhyay professor sanjay kumar mishra and uh, professor gorav kapoor they are the co-panelists so i will start the talk with my talk which is basically how we st- uh, came about uh, into this ic so i am i am uh, professor sandeep gupta i am from armed forces and uh, we have few training institutes in armed forces so basically it is a gist of what we have done there so i'll be covering it into uh, this heading i'll be giving the introduction followed by uh, what we have done the survey of teachers and the students so what do we expect from a resident all of us have been residents all of us have uh, gone through the phase of teaching also so out of a resident what we want is safety basically a resident should make safe diagnosis we want safety from him in the management of whatever patient he sees then what we want is basically basic surgical skills and basic handling of emergencies and what primarily we want out of him is not the hi-fi things what we want is safety of the patients so that is what our expectation uh, what we expect from a resident during his residency and immediately post uh, his residency also so what we did was uh, we surveyed a uh, few teachers which included 32 pg teachers from no, no, nine institutions both uh, ms and uh, dnb and it was a pan india survey and this is what we found see what they said was most of the students were reading standard textbooks but they were reading lot of things online also which was not authenticated second thing is they were reading lot of notes from their seniors and hands on uh, notes from passed on from nets there was lack of authentic references this was also very very common i think most of us have gone through this phase also there was a plethora of knowledge which is available in the internet but there is lot of confusion also so this is the first thing which came out of this survey from the pg teachers or the examiners second thing is uh, most of the residents were lacking in diagnosing common disorders they were lacking in giving uh, doing refraction and giving spectacle prescription which was because there was over reliance on uh, basically optometrists in most of the centers basic diagnostic skills were lacking and there was over reliance on equipment i'll give you example most of our residents are very happy saying there is a macular edema but clinically they cannot diagnose it is basically ocd diagnosis so the over reliance of equipment was very glaring once you talk to the examiners and if we have examiners here they will vouch was for this fact also there was a poor knowledge of medicines all of us will agree most of the residents don't know the generic names also they all know the brand names but generic names are lacking drug interactions they are not aware exact dosages they are not aware of so this is again one factor came up and second thing uh, most of the examiners they came up was there was no exposure to basic equipments and lasers this was the problem which came up once we uh, talked to the examiners then uh what they most examiners wanted was uh basic handling of trauma corneal ulcer and chemical injuries so these things are again came up uh while the survey was being done and uh, what most of the examiners they wanted out of their residents was that they should know basic cataract surgery corneal suturing and once you know corneal suturing and they should be they should be uh, knowing how to convert a case in case there is a complication phaco emulsification hence suturing was very very important and emergency managements so once we surveyed the resident which were 48 pg residents in nine institutions again pan india both ms and dnb 
what they wanted was they wanted guidance from faculty they wanted somebody to tell them okay read from one or two standard textbooks they didn't want a confusion in the textbooks then they wanted less of lectures more of interactive uh, sessions during the residency what the residents wanted was daily discussion review of cases because this is what was lacking most of the times residents are being used as mules in most of the institutions they are doing the bum job but they don't get any teaching don't they don't get any experience what they wanted was more faculty lectures and exposure to pg training programs all over the countryside which are happening by various institutions uh, the expectations was having skill lab uh, in the place where they were doing the presidency and on job monitoring by monitoring as well as mentoring by faculty and seniors which was lacking emergencies what point came up was that most of the times the residents were handling the emergencies themselves without any knowledge without any guidance from faculty so they wanted more involvement of faculties and more hands on surgeries in emergencies where faculty was available this was a pro this is a pan india problem when emergencies are hand handled by purely residents and nobody else and they wanted exposure to wet lab simulators and conferences this was again a wish list by the uh, uh, by both uh, teachers they wanted uh, this thing as well as the residents so what we did was we standardized a training program i think most of uh, most of the institutions have it but it is just a simple gist of how we did it the pg was divided into six semesters the mentors were detailed so basically every pg was under few senior residents and they were mentoring them and then faculty on top and then the program was divided into lectures opd ot training and evening trainings so basically what we did was first semester nothing else except the resident was exposed to only basic research methodology and thesis protocol theory we wanted only books like elkinton parson kurana basic uh, specialties they were exposed to pg uh, in opd only for refraction basic opd procedures and primary case workup only and lectures were basically taken by them for only symptomatology and art physio optics and drugs only nothing else during the first semester and ot they were the residents were coming in the morning they were arranging the trolleys setting up the machines this is again a important part of ot management if you don't know how to set a machine i think you should not be doing surgery the second thing was they exposed to skills lab simulator and evening rounds only fundus and uh, fundus examination slit lamp examination uh, they were exposed to and there were two exams taken at three monthly interval so again uh, in, in the next sessions i'll uh, the next speakers will talk about how to mentor and how to have this on job uh, monitoring by examinations then second and third semesters so basically these guys were collecting data for their thesis theory the level was increased to shields yanov and uh, kansky and opd they were under supervision of faculty and they were again uh, exposed to initial examination differential diagnosis and they were exposed to opd lasers also and now this this was the time when we introduced system wise ocular diseases and management in lectures and ot again they were first assistants now and they were uh, they were exposed to surgeries like pterygium conventional ecc and sics i think uh, most of us will agree this is a very important step rather than straight away exposing a resident to a phaco emulsification he should know how to do suturing he to do he should know how to do conventional surgery also because it helps when once he goes outside and he is working alone then they were exposed to skills lab simulators and evening round they were on independent call duty under supervision of sr then they were exposed to gonioscopies visual field topography oct all this was done in the evening so that they have time in discussing these things with their mentors and system uh, again examinations now this time now we had examination in next two semesters this this was system wise monthly examination so one month you had examination on cornea and accordingly like that something like that fourth and fifth semester is a time when they do their data analysis and thesis for thesis and submission this time now the level was increased to sub specialty books this is the time again they were doing independent opds with sr and all opd procedures with srs and this was the time when they were exposed to sub specialty clinical rotation also never before that before that it was all general uh, ophthalmology and and this is the time when they do lectures uh, where they have only case presentation and general club and nothing else and ot they were exposed to phaco emulsification apart from that lid and corneal trauma repair was also in their uh, curriculum this is very important this is what they should be exposed to skills lab simulator continue and evening rounds now this is the time they can be put on independent call duty in, and they can mentor their juniors also and they can have case discussions with their faculty on call 
Examinations again, this is the time when we expose them to three monthly examinations on university pattern now. So this is just a gradual introduction into examination pattern also. In the sixth semester, this is the time when we do topic wise review and review of last 10 year paper. This is very important. Now this is the time they should get exposed to the papers also. This is the time in OPD they do independent OPD and do all OPD procedures independently and subspeciality rotation continues and in lectures only case presentation, table viva, drugs and instruments because this is the time we expose them how to give an exam uh, uh, pattern. OT is the time if they want to come to the OT in, uh, at least for the first three to four months of the semester th that is the time they can do uh, complicated phaco emulsification, lid cornea trauma repairs management of complications and emergency surgeries under supervision and in evenings only review of cases and discussions for them as they are mentoring their juniors also and then we can introduce to them two monthly examination university pattern both theory and practical this is how you gradually introduce them to both the uh, clinical aspect also as well as the examination aspect also and it is important to have a SWOT analysis in the end where you can check their strengths what are their strengths what are their weaknesses give them opportunities in skills lab and simulators and as discussed earlier the threats are always the basic concept most of the residents are lacking in the basic concept that is where I think we should give more emphasis on so corrective steps were based on SWOT analysis if they had weak surgical skills more time in skills labs or simulators so if you have pure, pure theory poor theory or clinical uh, results in the SWOT analysis give them more evening session with the mentors so in conclusion, at least for the introduction part, what is important is having standardized protocols for residency training, have checklists, gradually upgrade their skills and most important thing is constant mentoring. As it is said, our excellence is an art won by training and habituation. We are what we do repeatedly. So excellence is nothing but an, uh, it is not an act, it is basically a habit. So repeated things are most important. So this is how I end. and. Uh, I will request my next speaker, uh, Professor Vijay, for his talk. Any, any comments or any suggestions by anybody because it is just a thing which is an ongoing thing. We have, this is what we follow in our institutions. So anything which can be added on it is, uh, any comments are most welcome at this time. So good morning everyone. Uh, I'll be covering the uh, wet lab or a skill lab training. Now why this is important as uh, Professor Sandeep uh, sir has already told it's very important whenever a resident who comes to join the ophthalmology he is not aware about the surgical challenges because these are different from a routine surgical practice you have to operate under microscope you have to have a very good hand eye coordination you have to have MB dexterity so these things are very very important and if uh, a resident is directly uh, uh, honing his skills onto a live patient or a human patient so it may be very difficult for him to be stress free as well as he may have a lot of uh, issues, he may cause a lot of damage to the uh, patient rather than causing a benefit. So it is very important to enhance three aspects uh, as far as the surgical skills are concerned. One is psychomotor skill, other is hand-eye coordination and third is MB dexterity. And these can be improved by uh, using a skill lab or a wet lab training uh, when the residents joins the ophthalmology as a PG resident. Now you don't need a huge setup, minimum you should have a 10 feet by 10 feet room in which you can have a simulator, you can have a, a wet lab uh, center on a table on the side and you need few uh, instruments or few other setups which I'll discuss in detail. Uh, as uh, I think most of us have done, we used to procure the uh, uh, eyes for our wet lab from our nearest butcheries. Uh, th th these could be either the goat size and nowadays uh, you may not uh, even get a uh, goat eyes but there are some phaco eyes which are already available in the market which can be utilized as a replacement for this goat size. Uh, there are various setups uh, which you can uh, plan in your skill lab. 
uh, if uh, you want the hardness of the nucleus to increase there is a solution which is known as Karnovsky solution. So once it is injected, if you inject it uh, uh, say within 5 to 10 minutes the nuclear grade changes basically it leads to hardness of the nucleus by coagulation of the lens proteins. So within 5 to 10 minutes it is as good as a nucleus sclerosis grade 2 and within about 20 to 25 minutes the hardness increases to nucleus sclerosis 4 or 5. Another thing you can do is you can do a micro uh, you can microwave the human uh, uh, nucleus which uh, has been taken out maybe after uh, uh, EC, ICCE. So that can also be used and you can practice your FACO skills on that nucleus. So uh, but with the availability of FACO eyes you may not uh, require this goat size because that these eyes are as good as uh, uh, human eyes. Now once you have these uh, uh, things available you need to fixate these uh, eyeballs. Uh, how do you do it? The cheapest way is you can use a styrofoam head in which you can make a socket in which these eyes can be fixed. The only problem is uh, yes it is low cost but it lacks stability. So whenever you start doing the uh, surgery so these move quite a bit. So uh, once the stability is not there. Uh, uh, due to manipulation it moves and uh, uh, it may be difficult for initial uh, practicing of these skills. Another uh, thing available is a Mendel practice eye mount. Now this Mendel practice eye, uh, eye mount again uh, this is eyeball fixating device it, it has a syringe and a clamp mechanism to maintain the globe fixation. The plastic eye holder is implanted in the center of this plexiglass mount. So this is also available freely in the market and most of vendors have it. Uh, it is connected to a syringe via plastic tube with a clamp which helps to maintain a suction throughout. So it gives a very good stability but the only disadvantage with this is it does not give that feel of a uh, since it is a flat mount so uh, the resident may not get a feel how to operate on a human head uh, that feel is not available. So it does not simulate the correct uh, hand positioning because it is a flat mount. The other thing available is a eye stand plus. This is an eyeball uh, stand with a fixation head. Now uh, you can see the eye, uh, this is the eye stand on the one side and other side is a fixation head. This eye stand can be mounted in the uh, fixation head uh, and you can use a FACO eye in this. And with the FACO eye now you can see that uh, this eye stand is mounted in the fixation head and the FACO eye is mounted on that in the eye stand. And, uh, in the FACO eye you can perform all the procedures, you can perform a rexis, you can perform a nucleotomy techniques. So these uh, all these uh, surgical skills can be improved by using these FACO eyes. So, uh, so you can do a, uh, so this is a divide and conquer being done, nucleus is being broken into various pieces. You can, uh, this gives a realistic feel uh, as, as it is uh, in a actual surgery. So uh, by using this and uh, I think a uh, uh, FACO eyes comes as a pack of 10 and cost is also not very high. So these can be utilized. You can uh, implant an eye oil also into this. So this will uh, give a complete uh, uh, feeling of a complete uh, surgery for a resident. So uh, he can improve all his hand-eye coordination and the surgical skills, nucleotomy techniques, intraocular lens implantation, all those techniques can be uh, improved by using this. Then there are some vacuum assisted glow fixation devices. One is known as spring action operators for fixation of eyeball. Again they provide a very good stability in this. Uh, even the, uh, the goat eyes or those everything can be fixed and also mounted in a head. So that also gives a realistic feel where you can do the rexis, where you can do the nucleus expression and also the suturing practices can be done. Similarly, so even uh, if you want to do a cornea wet lab. For that also you, you can use the uh, corneas which are not utilized uh, for the research purpose. You can mount that on an artificial anterior chamber. You can also use the various types of microkeratome to cut the corneas. You can remove the desmets and uh, uh, practice a DMEC uh, procedures in these. And uh, uh, so they, these setups can also be included to have a feel how, how the corneal transplants and how these things are done. Then there are simulator based training although this will be covered by uh, Dr. Srishti in the next talk. Uh, various types of simulators are available. Uh, the IC surgical simulator which was uh, uh, with the Haag Street. Uh, so in this uh, various protocols 
are available how the resident can improve the surgical skills uh, how he can monitor his progression over a period of time all those things can be done the other uh, in addition to ic surgical uh, or a hog street simulator there are micro vis touch simulator and also a phaco vision simulators multiple are available uh, so these will be discussed in detail uh, the next thing i would also like to tell that suturing practice is again very very important for all the residents to improve you can use the various things either you can use a 10-0 base and you can mark it in the way you want to suture and that uh, practice has to be done similarly a banana can be uh, marked with in a laceration can be marked and that can be sutured so all these things can be should be practiced in the skill lab to improve the surgical skills which you require which anyone uh, which all everyone require uh, during the surgery at some time or the other also there are some devices available for example in the last photograph you can see a uh, uh, practicing for the applanation tonometry this is an eye which is mounted on the slit lamp and you can practice applanation tonometry similarly for indirect ophthalmoscopy for uh, using the uh, for lasering uh, using the laser in the retina various types of protocols all those things are available and they can also be planned in the uh, skill lab so thank you very much thank you vijay uh, so all of us know once we go uh, upgrade ourselves from the skills lab, we have to go to the OT. So I request now Professor uh, Bandopadhyay to come and have his talk, which is basically training while in OT and assisting. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, so today after these two uh, talks, I am going to discuss main things, what are the protocols uh, of learning, basic steps, once uh, he is in the, the resident is in the first uh, year of his uh, residency and how can he improve his learning procedures and also in the second and third year. So this is observing to performing. A resident's journey is to first observe, learn, educate himself, communicate and then he becomes a performer by the end of his third year of residency. So coming to the first thing, importance of the OT in ophthalmology. As you know, in other specialties like general surgery or gynae or let it be ENT, uh, models, simulators are available which are very cheap, easily affordable and give a realistic, view, uh, realistic training onto it. But eye simulators are either available which are low cost but are not very representative of the natural eye. And the high-end simulators are very costly and they are available only in very apex, apex centers. So only way forward is for the resident to pick up the skills under his mentor in the OT setup, in the ophthalmological OT. So it is a primary training ground for developing surgical skills. The resident learns by observation, assisting and then slowly doing the steps. Also the most important thing, since in we are OT, OT is a very sensitive environment, it is a sterile environment. So we have to respect the environment and also since we are learning on a live patient, respect the patient's safety also. So the gradual involvement in the steps of surgery increases the confidence and competency over a period of time. So it is not a sudden procedure, you can't fast forward it, you have to follow the steps. So MHO to IMHO. So basic things uh, will be covered here, simulators and all. Uh, but the thing is that it is a teamwork and communication. Not only it is important to communicate with your mentors, but also other staff in the OT, like the operating room assistant and the nursing staff. They will be your mentors in the first year of training. And you will learn a lot of things from them. That is your backbone of your basic surgical practice. So once you communicate and take yourself as a part of a team, it will be easier to learn. You can't be in a shell. I know doctors are a little bit introverts because they have studied so they have become doctors but you have to come out of a shell when you are in PG training and communicate with everybody. That will make you an all-round practitioner. Coming to basic the foundations, I have divided into year-wise in the first six months. Basic thing in the first six months is to learn the what are the diagnosis, what are the surgery offered for those diagnosis, what are the indications. Also, what are the 
procedures, basic procedures in OT, like the maintenance of sterility, how the equipments are handled, cleaned. Then patient preparation. In the first six months, it is very important for the resident to understand that. Basic things like people dilatation, surgical marking, uh, and verifying the instructions given to the patient before surgery. Also certain procedures like peribulbar block, it's a great uh, thing for a first uh, resident in the first six months to learn to give a flawless peribulbar block. So these are the things which are required of a new resident. Also, it is very important how you take the patient from the pre-op room to the OT because it gives you a feeling how to handle the patient, how to communicate, how to touch the patient, how to ally his fear and all. So preparing the OT list, it looks like a mundane thing, but yeah, it has got a lot of things you can learn from it. You know what is the diagnosis, then you'll read about it, what are the surgeries offered to it, and what are the indications, contraindications. So maybe preparing OT list and you go into it will help you to brush up your knowledge. Also preoperative evaluation and documentation is very important to learn at this stage. Later on it will help you out in legal problems. So now the sterilization procedure is very So it is important in the first six months to visit the CCSD, the Central Sterile Department and see how the instruments are handled, how what is the protocol or the safety procedures, how uh, what are the indicators used. Also again, like the peribulbar thing this is the thing to learn in the first six months. Checklist is very important. Most of the problem occurring in ophthalmology is the wrong patient, the wrong eye or the wrong surgery offered to the eye. So it is important in your checklist before you start the surgery on a patient to confirm the identity, confirm which eye and what is the surgery offered. Also look for other sources of infection like people from village, they have, may have a nose pain, jewelry, bindi, etc. Even if you tell them, they may not register in the day previously. It is to be seen before the patient is taken to the OT. Pre-op instructions are important. Most of the patients are aged. Whatever you have said in the evening may not be remembered the next day. So you have to tell the patient to lie still, to communicate with voice only, not to move, look into the light again. The first year resident has to reiterate to the patient that these are the things to be observed. Also the main thing is how to take the patient from pre-op room to the OT. Like the patient has to be led by hand and this is the way you can uh, develop a bond how to handle a patient later on. So you have to carefully take the patient respecting the sterility of the OT and not also to make the patient apprehensive or injure the patient. Uh, coming to the uh, latter part of the first year of residency, uh, you have to observe the surgery under direct observations. Like I told you, simulators and all are very costly, not available, but you have to do the surgery under supervision, that observe the surgery under supervision. You should know what are the steps involved, brush up on your knowledge from standard textbooks, what are the instruments used for all the various surgeries, stepwise, and see your senior residents, how is arranging the trolley. What is the sequence of arrangement? Why is giving the instrument? This you have to learn by observations. Nobody else can teach you separately. So you have to be very observant in your OT. Also in your first year, you should learn how to set up the first, uh, the basic cataract trolley setup. Other surgeries can be learned after that. Because that is the cataract is our bread and butter. And in the first year, you may be again towards the end assisting the assistant. Like the second or third year, uh, the resident may be assisting the main surgeon or the consultant. So you become assistant to him. See how is he behaving with the surgeon, how is he handling the instruments. So again these are the photographs how to make the trolley. The trolley making is very important. Again you have to respect sterility. You have to give a long plastic sheets are available. Well time it was not available or well, that's a boon. You place the plastic sheet so that it doesn't absorb water and all and you have to keep the instruments on it in a sequential manner thinking in mind what are the steps of surgery and again handling the equipment to the surgeon in a sequential manner according to his preference. Also very important is this FECO machine and VR machines they are very technology demanding you have to understand in the first year what is the dynamics what are the physics behind it so that all the parameters you can understand after that and also you have to be very uh, conversant with the machine parameters because every surgeon has got different parameters and you have to be seamlessly transition from one surgeon to the next surgeon. So understanding this FECO machine parameters are very important before you actually do steps on it. 
So this is what observing, like uh, most of the microscope now have a side port in which you can observe side uh, eyepiece in which you can observe the surgery directly. Earlier times it was not, uh, not available or you have to get it separately. You now coming to subspeciality uh, rotations, like as you know from MBS you are trans uh, transition to PG, from PG to fellowship. So to make the transition very smooth, from the second year onwards, you should show interest in subspeciality surgery, basically oculoplasty, vitroretinal and corneal surgeries. These are the surgeries, if you see, observe, you will gain interest in it and it will be a seamless transition from your PG to your further fellowship. So again, these are the steps which you should do under close guidance. By the end of second year, you will be offered steps in surgeries like incision making, capsular access, divide and conquer in a stepwise pattern, may not be full continuous full surgery, but you should learn the steps by the end of second year. So this is where uh, in our institute, the second year of performing surgeries under guidance, direct guidance. Certain surgeries they can perform fully like region, they can be proficient by second year and other minor surgeries, but cataract surgery stepwise one lung, especially FECO. So by the end of uh, the final year, that is the third year, you should be able to do surgery under supervision. Like the first was the building block, second was you are practicing in a stepwise manner, few steps. But by the third year, you should know a uh, full surgery, basic surgery, you should be knowing like cataract surgery. You should know how to remove pterygium, what are the various steps, basic glaucoma surgery and basic squint surgeries, horizontal squints and all. You should know how to do it independently, but under supervision. So again, for this mentorship is very important and this communication with your mentors, with your other staff will help you become a good surgeon. Sometimes the lower staff will give you some tips, like your uh, mentor may be busy in some other things, but your uh, assistant or a junior staff will tell you that this is what you have to do in this case. If you have a problem, they sometimes help you out. So communication is very important. So that's what we again reiterate, guidance and feedback from senior orthodontists must and you should also communicate with the lower staff. So finally, this is what is the main aim, like your consultant is standing on the corner and you are operating independently. So operating under guidance by the end of third year, that should be the main goal. So the whole process is like uh, initially once you go to any job, you are being directed by your boss, then you are coached. So that is the second year. Then you are supported in your task and finally you are delegated. So that is the journey, directing, coaching, supporting, and independently working, delegating. So this is the journey in the first three, three years of your residency. So again, we retreat residency training in the OT fosters a gradual progression from observation to independent surgical performance. And by assisting, observing, you ultimately become a good surgeon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So what we uh, got it from here that it, the process has to be gradual and it cannot be rushed and most important thing is assessment at every level and the best way of assessment and learning is by simulator so i request major shishti for a talk on uh, surgical training on simulators that's the next talk thank you sir a very good morning to everyone So simulation has been widely used to great effect in many high risk industries and is well validated in a number of medical disciplines. As we gather here to discuss standardization of training methodology, introduction of surgical virtual reality simulator deserves a mention. Good stereoacuity, spatial awareness, precise hand to eye coordination and ability to use all four limbs simultaneously are the quintessentials for, for performing an uneventful intraocular surgery. So historic take on cataract surgery training has involved experimental models and wet lab training as sir has already covered on animal or synthetic eyes which were highly unstructured allowed and it allowed only rehearsal of few steps of cataract surgery and it lacked any form of ob objective assessment. So increased focus on proficiency based training in surgical disciplines led to a demand for objective assessment tools. Virtual Reality Surgical Simulator is a computer-based simulated environment with high performance computer graphics and a specialized software which provides visual, tactile and auditory feedback simulating a true life environment. The Hark Street Simulator is by far the most investigated in ophthalmic practice and it has been recently proc procured at two of our army centers and it comes with a mannequin head which can be used in two orientations that is superior and temporal. The instruments contain colored heads with from which optical tracking systems 
convert movements to electric signals and are relayed to the simulator after being inserted into the eye. Therefore, all necessary instrument types can be recreated inside the eye. And as in real life operating situation, there are two foot pedals, one to maneuver the microscope and the other to control the fluidics. Looking through the microscope, the trainees experience interaction with tissue and intraocular structures, which are simulated in real time. The interface uh, which comes with the simulator follows a standardized curriculum from category A, which covers training in basic skills like depth perception and bi-manual navigation and gradually stepping up to category D, which trains in managing various complicated scenarios like posterior capsular rent. So th these are the tiers of training which are available in the cataract module and it involves uh, the basics of microscopes also, microscope also, which uh, in real life scenario we ourselves have to learn in the OT. So uh, training includes management of the ports like we can see in this video that how it is uh, the ports have to be managed to avoid undue, undue wound stress, loss of viscoelastic or diminished red reflex to depth perception and manipulation of the instrument inside the anterior chamber. Complica complications. To highly precise surgical steps like performing capsular excess, this is uh, on the simulator. It, lo it actually looks like a real eye. And to uh, performing nucleus management, algorithms have been finely tuned to recreate accurate tissue characteristics and thereby allow realistic simulation of procedures. It also teaches management of various complicated scenarios like using pupil expanders in small pupil cases and enlargement of small rexes and even management of complications like posterior capsular drain by teaching the steps of anterior vitrectomy. So the trainee is uh, well equipped men mentally to enter the operating theater and uh, uh, case facing cases in real life. So this highlights, this is a side to side comparison between simulator and real eye showing the steps of uh, capsular excess in a case of mature cataract. I'm sorry, the video is not playing. So basically this is that video in which um, it actually simul it's li looking really similar that uh, this is a real eye we are doing capsular access uh, in real time and on simulator this is how it looks but I'm sorry the video is not playing. So having a simulator at our center proved as a boon for us and this is my own comparative video of capsular access in a real eye from my residency days. On the left um, Actually, this is a video in which I could not even manipulate our, my instrument inside the eye and my hand was covering the surgical field. But after a few months of training over in uh, on the simulator, I could easily maneuver my instrument inside the eye and smoothly complete the rexus. So this uh, simulator also comes with a vitro-retinal interface, which comes with integrated biome, mimicking functions just like real wide angle viewing system. And uh, these are the three uh, tiers of training which comes with the vitro-retinal interface. The introductory uh, tier involves basics of uh, instrument navigation inside the vitreous cavity and usage of non-dominant hand and uh, gradually stepping up to teaching the complex vitro-retinal surgeries like retinal detachment or foreign body removal from the eye. So from lifting the uh, vitreous, posterior vitreous face on simulator vis-a-vis -vis in real eye to doing it in the real eye to, I'm sorry, the video, this video. To doing intricate surgeries like epiretinal membrane peeling on simulator vis-a-vis -vis in real eye. And in, in addition to the myriad benefits of training from the simulator, it also allows the opportunity to examine other aspects of working in an operation th operating theater that cannot otherwise be ethically investigated without putting the patients at risk, like the effects of distraction or fatigue on the surgeon. This can also be checked with the simulator. And at the end of each task, simulator gives a detailed feedback assessment with precise pointers to refine the surgery. And to ensure reliable skill levels, trainees need to reach given score three times in a row before proceeding to the next task. 
and the evidence based performance assessment gives both educators and residents confidence in surgical skills before operating on a real eye there are other simulators available in the market like faco vision micro vis touch help me see eye surgical simulator which differ from the one that we have at our center th that is a hack street one that uh, micro vis touch comes with virtual mobile head uh, head eye and instruments so it gives uh, the uh, the um, idea of actually operating on a real head and eye which does not does which is not there with hack street or faco vision or any other simulator and unlike other simulators help me see surgical simulator teaches the steps of uh, manual small incision cataract surgery which includes scleral tunnel formation also so since 2003 more than 60 studies have been done on application of virtual reality simulator in ophthalmology from examining construct validity of simulator to transfer of skills to the operating room and uh, similar articles have been published and one of them uh, includes uh, by mckennell et al which compared the results of capsular excess of first and second year residents who were not exposed to simulator versus third and fourth year residents who were trained on simulator and they reported 68% lower mishaps in the train group when performing capsular excess similarly ferris et al reported 38% reduction in posterior capsular tear in the train group leading to overall decrease in patient morbidity and cost reduction but all said and done although simulator training makes us better equipped for the operating room the surgical pearls that we learn from our seniors in the operation theater are irreplaceable thank you thank you shishti uh, now we go to the final uh, session basically it is the critical an ass assessment analysis at various stages of residency so i'll, I'll request uh, professor gorak papu to have this talk इसमें लगा लें इसमें देखा या अरे यहाँ देख स्क्रीन पे morning coming to the last presentation of this uh, gp i'll be covering video recording of cases and the critical analysis and assessments at various stages which has been covered by the various speakers so just a brief overview of that and a final conclusion so there, there are two more sessions i'm i'm already in a sitting session uh so why video recording of cases we have covered simulators we have covered uh, training we have covered the uh, on job training so it is an important part of higher education it uh, provides an important content uh, delivery platform where you can deliver content at a later stage uh, video in education is i would say affordable now because most of the microscopes now come integrated and you get off the shelf uh, recorders which are actually cheap on amazon and various websites video content is accessible and reproducible this is the most important part it is accessible both to the teacher and to the student for assessing the video himself at a later stage so this is the most important part and it promotes engagement the earlier speakers spoke of engagement with your juniors spoke of engagement with your seniors so this covers it is an important part of that also so for resident cases video recording is crucial in the learning process because it is a two way tool so you have an interaction with your teacher who can then guide you on the steps where you have gone wrong for the trainee to assess himself about the steps his technique and where he is lacking in hand eye coordination which obviously he picks up on the simulator also as the previous speaker explained for the teacher to watch on site if you have a real time assessment and for assessment later to evaluate the gradual process improvement so again it is a step by process you take steps you do video recording at various steps you do recording at various stages of residency so do it in the third year when he graduates to faco 
you can have a program in place where you can do the recording of each resident say two cases per month and compare the cases over the next six months and guide the student as to where he has improved where he has remained stagnant or where he needs improvement so these are the advantages of a video assessment and again like i said periodically self assess his or her performance now the advantages it is active learning student resident engagement uh, it has a cognitive effect and improves the motivation because the student knows that i have somebody here who is looking after me now if you saw the video on the previous slide it was the same resident who had a issue in cracking the nucleus uh, he was not able to split the nucleus now this is the same resident 3 months down the line where you can see is effectively performing a feco this is 3 months down the line on a similar case in a similar situation he is drastically improved i would say 30 to 40% improvement so this improves the motivation also the resident himself is seeing i am so much better than what i was 3 months back now this is again a case uh, where the student is operating now if i pause here uh, immediately what do you notice the shadow at the end of the trench so this case is going to end up in trouble so you can guide the student real time and when you assess later so this patient eventually had a pcr and it had to be taken over by the uh, faculty who was guiding and completed the case so these are situations where if you are watching the patient live you are watching the surgery live you can guide the student real time or if you have a recording and you can guide the student and tell him where the problem was now at this step you can notice the bright glow at the end of the trench so this is where the rent probably took place because the trenching was due too deep at the end now coming to critical analysis and assessment at various stages has been covered by all the speakers so education is basically a repetitive and ongoing criterion referenced assessment and in the case of medicine or a post graduation it includes direct observation that is where the advantage is not classroom based learning it is observation based learning and on the job learning so the ideal assessment tools for us would be should be practical where successfully appraise the resident performance without placing any additional burden on him and there should be no burden on the administration also and the evaluators so you are doing a on the job training while you are working while you are working with the patient and while you are operating so there is no separate assessment which is required and it requires goal oriented tasks and specific observation which the previous speakers uh, Uh, Kanal Sandeep also covered in his introduction, uh, where you have a set protocol and a set schedule for the first year, for the second year, and for third year. So it is part of that assessment. Now the assessment tool should be reliable, valid, reproducible, and practical. So the uh, ideal six pilot tools for competency assessments include written and oral exams, 360 degree evaluations, which uh, include feedback from your peers and your seniors, faculty, patients. feedback is also important and non physician members which include your paramedical staff or the support staff direct observations within operative and clinical studies which has been covered and journal clubs also forms an important part which is not part of the presentation but it is part of all the assessment tools that we follow now uh, there is a global rating assessment of skills in intraocular surgery grasses which was produced as a complementary subjective assessment along with oss now these are standards which have been developed over the years and these are available on the public domain uh, presently the ophthalmic surgical competency assessment rubric oscar is a series of standardized internationally accepted skill based tools which have been developed eye surgical skill assessment test is another skill testing program by ico now along with this we need to assess the other competencies uh, like i said the medical knowledge is assessed with written and oral, uh, oral exams patient care is assessed with patient surveys we have patient surveys in all our hospital where we take a feedback this can be gradually uh, used to incorporate a feedback on the residents and the first year second year and third year residents who are directly dealing with the patient at various steps either in the opds or in the uh, surgical ots and objective structured uh, clinical examination or better known as oskis where standardized patients are used in various scenarios which we have now started doing in our final exams also oskis uh, they used to be a big part of uh, dnb nb exams till the uh, early 2000 then it was stopped for some years now from the covid era we have again gone back to oskis which is an important part of assessment 
So to conclude and summarize uh, what all the speakers have said, the basic idea is to standardize trailing uh, methodology, uh, implement the curricula as it is prevalent worldwide. And the most important part, since we are a skill-based uh, subject, to include skill assessment as part of the overall teaching program so that we can actually uh, judge our students and rate them as to their skilling and the gradual upskilling which takes place over the next three years. So the whole idea which I come to, which is a corporate term, is gradual upskilling. That is the term which is the in thing these days. So it starts with assisting a part of wet lab and skills lab, which our uh, presenters said, simulators, introduction to real cases, of which recording is a very important part, and real-time assessment, which takes place at various stages of residency. So you decide an assessment program, which is interposed with these various steps of upskilling. So you have assessment at various steps and to judge each step and decide if the student is fit enough to move to the next step of his training or not. Thank you. Uh, for a uh, lovely presentation. We have a simple thing that we used to do in FMC. Once in a week, one day was meant for all the students' videos. So all cases of the residents which have been done, done by residents, they were just reviewed in that class only and that just cases were just flashed. Uh, and all the videos were flashed and everybody learns out of that. And so it's a good thing. We, uh, reviewing our own cases as well as residents' cases on video recording is a wonderful thing, which uh, you learn a lot by them. Well, if, if I can add on, one thing which I didn't cover is video recording. Actually, uh, often there is a lot of ego involved. Even the teacher can record his own cases and display to the students. I have numerous cases where I have made mistakes. I review them periodically, even 10 years back. If you can show these cases to your student, there's no harm in it because he learns from your videos also. So we come to our end of our, uh, 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 I see, not the show, and any, any questions are most welcome. So if no questions, I thank all my speakers of this IC and I think we'll conclude this session well in time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Move to the next hall. Yeah. Okay.